So just to begin very quickly, I'm going to do a share screen. So you will see one page. In, a, in this pandemic world, what I've started doing is instead of using a PowerPoint, I just use one single page to ensure that we don't have to worry about, you know, turning these uh, PowerPoints around. So this is one page summary of the judgment which NCLT has passed and you will see, you know, some of you have, and by local, I just mean national law school context here, but I've very deliberately chosen a title with a question mark which says barbed wire is a redistribution a legitimate realm of NCLT concern. Let me explain this a bit. And the way we do these lectures, some of you are of course familiar and for others who are not familiar, I'll quickly stop uh, sharing screen. Thirty-three. I'll just show it to you where my inspiration for this phrase is coming from. Just to make sure I don't pass this off as my own innovative idea. Because I'm not, of course, assuming that you are all familiar with the judgment. If you are, it's good if you have managed to read it. If you're not familiar, you will see. So this, uh, this is also partly, you know, evidence to show that I've read and that is meant as, of course, as a joke. But you will see this is page 33 of the judgment and it says, you know, land of the state for lazing around bobbing the class, right? And on the left hand side, I put this comment, which is barbed wire. And you will see why this is critical. I've again stopped sharing the text of the judgment. The way actually National Company Law Tribunal goes about formulating the issue, to my mind, is quite interesting at one level, but also raises a lot of concerns related to company law and other legislations itself. But let's see whether, you know, we can collectively make sense of it. So once again, just to make sure we are all on the same page, even if you have not read the judgment, you know, I will deal with some factual aspects, but that's not how we do these lectures. Uh, in general, what I do is I make my claim upfront and then get on to the details of the uh, case study. So let me actually look at the one page of which I had put initially once again, and I'll tell you what my claim is, right? So you can already see from the title, this is something about redistribution, right? And this is what I intend to prove over the course of this uh, lecture, which is uh, the tribunal, which is NCLT over here, in its concern for redistribution, glosses over the Companies Act 2013 and stare decisis. I'll explain both of these. How is it that I'm making a claim? that NCLT has glossed over Companies Act 2013. And then accordingly, what I'm also making as another claim is that, or something which follows as a corollary, is that this, uh, this is an emblematic case study in avoidable transaction cost, engendering uncertainty and unpredictability. Now, this is the larger claim, and this is how I'll go about proving this claim. You can see four parts or five parts to my uh, arguments here. And this is all that I'll put on the screen now. So there is no PowerPoint as such. There are these five parts of the argument and I'll deal with each one of them one by one. Now, just as a housekeeping, of course, all over again, if you have any question at any point of time, please feel free to ask your question. We don't wait till the end of the lecture for the purposes of questions. Secondly, of course, you know, this is also meant as a collective enterprise. So if you are somebody who has a view on the judgment or a view on what I'm saying or something which is unclear, then please feel free to interrupt as well. Okay, with that, let me go back to the one page job and then we can begin with the argument. Now remember that the claim that I'm making is that you know NCLT has glossed over the companies at 2013 and also stare decisive stats. So let's start actually with the first part of argument, which is let's look at the ratio or the holding of this particular judgment, right? How exactly the case is coming about at uh, NCLT? Right? 
So this is a case which is arising under what section 241 of Companies Act 2013. And I can actually put it up for you if you have a screen. You can see this. So if you look at, for instance, you know, MCA website, so let me put this up on the screen. It'll just take a couple of seconds to do this. But I have all of these on the screen just to make sure all of us are on the same page, right? So here it goes. So you'll see this is from MCA website, by the way, for people who are unfamiliar. Uh, so this is just taken from the Ministry of Corporate Affairs website. You'll see there's something called eBooks, right? So if you click on this chapter 16, it's about prevention of oppression and mismanagement. And there is something called section 241. So this uh, case arises under section 241, more specifically under clause two though, not under clause one, right? Okay, now hang on. I've lost the web page here, but I'll just reopen it all over again to make sure that you can see what I'm talking about, right? Okay, so you will see this is uh, okay. What's the two forty? Okay, so this is two forty one clause two. If you see it says, and we'll go slightly slow over here to make sure everybody is on the same page. And I'll also highlight. So it says the central government, if it is of the opinion that the affairs of the company are being conducted in a manner, and it says prejudicial to public interest. It may itself apply to the tribunal for an order under this chapter. So essentially, you'll see this case comes about to 241 clause 2. There are some aspects of 241 clause 3 as well, which has only recently been added into company. Right? We'll touch upon them as we go on uh, later in the part of this lecture. So now going back to the one page, so you see what is it that you know we are trying to suggest over here. So when you see 241 clause 2, so insofar as the ability or the entitlement of the central government to initiate the proceeding is concerned, that doesn't seem to be in doubt because the statutory provision seems to be clear. But interestingly, what happens is that there are certain interim reliefs that the central government is asking for, right? And central government here is being represented through Ministry of Corporate Affairs. Now, essentially what the tribunal does it, is that it grants some final relief, which is slightly different from the interim prayers which are being asked for. What is the difference? So you'll see the second po point here, which is, so Ministry of Corporate Affairs is asking for appointment of an administrator, essentially to take over the functioning of Delhi Chimkhana Club. Right? What essentially the tribunal does though, is that you know, it's unclear as to why is it that they don't grant a permission for appointment of an administrator, but they do say that you know, they are going to appoint this uh, members of the governing board who can make sure that the functioning of Delhi Gymkhana club in the interim is carried on properly or equitably as the tribunal believes it to be. Now, so this is just a basic background. You would have also seen, I've just assumed that, you know, some basic parts of the judgment you are aware of, but if you are not, well, this case is concerned about uh, this, uh, you know, exclusive or, you know, sort of an elite as the judgment calls it, club called Delhi Gymkhana Club, which is based in uh, Delhi, of course, right? It's also very old. Uh, it comes from the British Raj, you know, You'll also see all throughout the NCLT judgment, there is an underlying concern about elitism, right? And therefore you can also go back to my title and see why I have uh, pointed out the idea of redistribution as a legitimate concern of uh, NCLT, the National Company Law Tribunal. Right? Now, any questions so far? You know, because this is the first part and this is very basic, but this lays the foundation for what I'm going to say later. But if there is any question, there are two things you can do. One is you can, of course, voice your question. Two is uh, you can also put it on the chat, which will be visible to all of us, right? So assuming that nobody has any questions uh, so far, 
I'll go back to my one pager and look at uh, other aspects of this judgment as well. Right? So the, in the first part, the question that which I raise is this, what is the standard for interim injunction? Because if the entire claim, you know, just taking the judgment on, in, on its own terms, frankly, by the way, <clears throat> because, excuse me, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs is asking for an interim relief for interim injunction, right? If you have read the judgment, you will see one of the arguments which is being made on behalf of Delhi Jim Khanna Club, DGC in short, is they say that the interim relief cannot be the same as final relief and they cite some Supreme Court decisions and all, right? And that is something which seems like a proposition one cannot really correlate. With. But let's say, for instance, if you are to, if you were the judge at NCLC, right, and if somebody is asking for an interim injunction, what would be the standard for interim injunction that you will utilize? So, since nobody else is speaking, I am posing this as a question for you, so that you know, we also make it more like a dialogue. Now, this, this is something which should be a relatively straightforward question, right? For any court, when they are trying to grapple with this idea of whether or not to grant interim injunction, what is the standard that they utilize? Um, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, I'm not sure if someone else was speaking, but I was saying that one of the things a court considers is the balance of inconvenience as to which party is um, more likely to be harmed irreparably if right. the interim relief is not granted. Right. Excellent. So, so that's one. So there is a three prong test, right? So that's one prong. So somebody is going to say the Samir. other prong, right? Go ahead. Please, please. Samir, please go ahead. Yes, please. So. Uh, one more thing can be uh, uh, whether prime FSI there uh, appears to be a case uh, as in a chance for a situation where interim damage is needed. Right. So both Surbi and Aditya, they are both absolutely bang on. They are right. So one is the uh, first one is there should be a prime FSI case. And then the second one is uh, balance of convenience. And lastly, I think Sartak Vadva has put on chat as well. Uh, this idea of irreparable injury or ir irreversible damages. And Surbi had mentioned this as well, right? Now, this is a three-pronged test. Now, regardless of whether you have uh, done this or read this judgment or not, let me ask you another question. Uh, would you expect, let's say if you are reading this judgment, would it be legitimate for all of us as, let's say, students of law to expect the tribunal to say that this is the standard for interim injunction or not? Uh, no, sir. This won't be the only the, only the criteria for interim injunction because tribunal does not follow the strict rules of CCC. It also follows the rules of natural justice. Correct. So that's fine. So that's absolutely right. So the in terms of the Companies Act 2013, the code of civil procedure is not binding on the NCLC, right? The tribunal. Of course, you know what section 424 of Companies Act 2013 also states is that although CPC is not binding, principles of natural justice, they continue to apply, right? But does that mean, so you see, I mean, these standards when we spoke, when, let's say, you know, when we talked about them, these three standards are the three prong test, right? Prima facie I view, or balance of convenience and irreparable injury, right? Where do they come from? Right? Do they come from CPC? Do they come from, let's say, state decisis, past precedents of the Supreme Court? Where do they come from? So if the source or if let's say the origin is only CPC, then the argument which Parnika is making, that sounds about right, right? But if the source is also precedence, right? In which case, if it is stare decisis, then the tribunal will not really have a leeway to ignore them, right? Okay, Pranav has put this on the chat. So judicial interpretation of 424 has read principles of CPC within principles of natural justice. In any event, so that's right, Prana, but in any event, 
even cpc is supposed to be an uh, instance or example of application of principles of natural justice so there is hardly a tension between code of civil procedure and principles of natural justice right but anybody wants to respond on the idea of this three prong test what's the source is is this just the cpc or can one also read the three prong test of prima facie case and other tests onto a uh, stare decisis a uh, past president of supreme court of india so i think this should be president as well stare decisis so i think there there should be it looks like you know there is a president and there is indeed you know there are several presidents which will speak about this idea of interim injunction right like for instance you know in a competition law context which uh, otherwise you know takes a lot of my time uh, there is a three judge bench decision of the supreme court of india in 2010 called steel authority of india limited they are talking about interim injunctions and what's the standard for interim injunction and the three judge bench of the supreme court reiterates it's not laying down the law for the first time but it reiterates the idea of the three prong test which is that you know there has to be a prima facie case there has to be a balance of convenience that has to be judged and also they need to look at the idea of irreparable injury right interestingly by the way this nclt decision does not really talk about this standard at all quite interesting because you know for me as a reader i had expected the nclt to remind us that this is the precedent which it is going to uh, follow it doesn't and therefore if you go back to my screen share this first aspect on ratio and holding and when i'm talking about the standard for interim injunction since it glosses over a past precedent if you can go back to my claim where i am saying that you know it's a uh, glosses over companies act and there is a typo here and stare decisis right so you can say the stare decisis or a past precedent related to interim injunction has certainly been ignored by nclt now this finishes my first part of the argument i will get on to the second part unless somebody has a question right okay as since i don't see any questions so let me move on to the second part i mean and this will also amplify the point related to redistribution just in case you are wondering you know what is the redistribution that we are talking about so nclt here the tribunal has this underlying concern and that concern is uh, you know best actually just read out from the judgment and i'll draw your attention to para 17 of the judgment i'll put that on the screen so that you will see what is it that i'm talking about i So let's look at uh, para seventeen of the decision. Okay, now see what is it that they are saying. On reading the above, anybody can infer the club has come into existence for the then ICS officers. So they are talking about the past, the British Raj. And it says that time it was mostly for English to chill out in the evening, and obviously it is their culture. Therefore, they cherish their culture wherever they rule, and that's why bar in you know, a different way. And then, of course, it says king is king, whichever country it is. And it says after English left this country, this ruling elite culture has seeped into independent India through usage of this club. Once get into it, is always relishing. See, I'm not sure whether I follow everything that is uh, written over here, but I. ask you to i request you to just read the judgment because this is what it says and it says it is hardly possible to come out of this kind of culture it could be that this club must have come into the hands of indian officers after english left this country and then it talks certain things about constitution there are similar stuff which it uh, summarizes much later in the text of the judgment i'll draw your attention towards that part of the judgment as well uh just to make sure we are all on the same page is much later in the judgment i don't recall the page number but i will just uh, get this in a minute if you bear with me then now so what it does is it much later it summarizes what is the concern that it has right so let's see if i can get this quickly 
because the judgment itself is pretty long it's 81 pages but unfortunately you know it's uh, not so easy to handle um, let's see it so okay now to see this para 62 and this is uh, much towards the end so you can see on the top this is page 72 of 81 of the judgment and this is page 62 and once again why are we reading this part because i want to draw your attention to what is the underlying concern of the ncl right read this it says it's a case saying section 8 of the company running on government owned land notice this run by a coterie of people bringing in the children of permanent members a very long sentence but it says a lot about what's their underlying concern and it says children of permanent member and children's children for using facilities of the club despite several members remaining outside for decades altogether when government officer retires taking him into private members quota and using cross of rupees collected from waitlist members and its own money and using private property of 27 acres of land in the Latians Delhi adjacent to Prime Minister's residence worth of thousands of cross or minimum annual rent of thousand rupees and then notice this part which I have already highlighted it says lazing around in the evening for drinking this is the underlying concern I mean if one has to amplify this or spell it out there's there are three things it's saying that the land has been given by the government it's being used by the elite and the children of the elite and it also says all of these people what they use the club for is that they laze around in the evening for drinking what you saw in the earlier paragraph the nclt characterizes as chilling out culture whatever that might mean i'm not sure whether that's how nclt understands what's the meaning of chilling out and it you have sense and it says that you know this is the culture which is there and the elite is just using this facility for the purpose of lazing around in the evening for drinking. Now you see this, if you follow the later part, it says it amounts to prejudice of public interest. Quite interesting, right? This is para 62. And let me stop sharing the screen there. And I will get back to the one page that I have. So this is the underlying concern that NCLT has, right? And you can see where the concern for redistribution comes about and what could possibly be problematic over here right so you see i mean the question really is this right? which is so we are on point two over here this is uh, nclt's underlying concern in para 17 they talk about chilling out in para 62 there's something they are talking something about you know people who are just uh, lazing around right in that sense you can see that you know there is a concern that this is very elitist club and something needs to be done about it. interestingly by the way the ministry of corporate affairs had characterized this club as a parivar club by the way very interestingly you know and this is in the petition before nclt in one part of the nclt decision they recount this and they say that you know the petitioners complain that this is just a Parivar club. Now you see, so where the concern for redistribution is coming from, it should be obvious to you, right? So this is the part where I explain to you what is the meaning of redistribution in my title, just to go back. You can see now I explain what is barbed wire, this comes from page 33. And then is redistribution a legitimate realm of NCLT concern, right? Some parts of claim I have already explained to you, which is that the tribunal in its concern for redistribution, right? And now it should be obvious to you why am I talking about concern for redistribution? I'm saying my claim is that it glosses over the Companies Act 2013 and stare decisis. In the first part on ratio and obiter, we have already seen the idea of stare decisis and how it is being glossed over. We'll see just in a bit how it's also ignoring the Companies Act 2013, right? That brings to an end the second part of my presentation. So I'm momentarily going to stop sharing screen. There are some questions which are being put on the chat, so I hadn't seen this earlier. Let me say this. 
Uh, Pranav, I think you have mentioned this judgment on Metalix Limited versus Union of India. Yeah, that's what they're citing as well. And then the concern of those who don't get membership despite paying some consideration can more appropriately be addressed in the consumer forum, right? I understand some expansive interpretation of consumer would be required, but that isn't implausible, right? Yes, Pranav, I suppose, you know, not just the Consumer Protection Act, I suppose there could be so many alternative ways to address this, right? Which is, I suppose, you know, it could be a constitutional law issue as well, right? In fact, in one part of the judgment, there is a tussle between uh, Article 14 and Article 19. And it's very interesting how the tussle comes about. The respondents, that is uh, Delhi Gymkhana Club, makes an argument that why is it that the tribunal is in their business because after all in terms of article 19 in the constitution the club is entitled to carry on with its business and then the tribunal quickly responds that well if you are citing article 9 it is also article 14 which talks about equality right what the tribunal of course glosses over is that you know the tribunal the nclt that is is not a constitutional court right it's a specialized body set up for the purposes of adjudication of disputes, which arises under two enactments. One, the Companies Act 2013, and two, the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code, right? Might also have maybe other incidental work and all which uh, other statutes might possibly grant to it. But primarily, primarily speaking, this is what the tribunal is supposed to do, right? But nevertheless, you see the tribunal is quick to suggest that you know there is something constitutional as an issue which is involved over here. And that's quite interesting in my view because it uh, ignores, if you would recall, all our past discussions in the context of at least the Friday lecture series uh, and as well as corporate law one, where we had looked at cases like Roger Matthew, Cellular Operators Association of India, Madras Bar Association. All of these judgments are concerned about an expertise-based national company law tribunal. Right? But you know, it looks like the fears of the Supreme Court in Madras Bar Association seems to have come true in the context of uh, NCLT decision in Delhi Gymkhana Club because the tribunal, at least in this case, doesn't seem to appreciate that constitutional law issues are not really its remit. Uh, so there is a private message here, but yes, I mean, of course, you can uh, make your observations. I'm not taking the name only because it's privately messaged to me. But there is a message, and of course, if you have an observation, please go ahead. Sir, I want to say that the inherent consistency that we are observing in this case about the tribunal judgment, that is also symptomatic to the administrative law problem of the tribunalization of justice. And that is the reason when the cases from NCLT and NCLAT, when it goes to Supreme Court, most of the time we have seen in 2019, 18 and 20 also, in the initial part it gets overturned. Because here when we look at the person who is delivering the judgment, they are basically from the administrative side and the problems related with the judges probably going for these inconsistencies more related to their predilections coming into play rather than the principles. I certainly appreciate that point, Shant. It's a good point. And the example that you take, just to make sure that, you know, uh, we are on the same page. You are saying most of these decisions which are administered by uh, agencies, they are overturned in the Supreme Court. That's your benchmark that you are utilizing for the purposes of lack of expertise. I will only suggest a note of caution, Shant. That note of caution is very simply this. If only the Supreme Court of India were not the final court, if only the Supreme Court decisions could be appealed in some other forum. Let's say, for instance, you know, just as an instance. Let's say, you know, we establish a new body where Supreme Court of India decisions can be overturned. I suppose a similar statistics will emerge for the Supreme Court of India judgments as well, right? Where most of its decision will be overturned. So I'm not sure that is the benchmark that we should utilize. I think, you know, we should take the NCLT decision on its own terms try and see whether it is a speaking order, you know, and if you look at it closely, although I have characterized my presentation as a very law and economic space, because that's my area of interest. 
but equally speaking you can also see my presentation is really just trying to look at whether the nclt decision is a speaking order does it give reasons and when we say reasons in law we mean does it give legal reasons which are intelligible to other lawyers in the community right and see the the law and economics based reasoning is just one subset of those legal reasoning right but one can equally criticize or comment upon the nclt decision just based on the third prong of principles of natural justice that because judges cannot really come out and defend their judgments their judgments must speak for itself those uh, orders that they pass they must be reasoned orders for me i'm not sure whether it's really so material whether a judgment is overturned or not overturned because after all you see the moment you have a higher uh, let's say adjudicating authority it is their job to look at whether the reasons appeal to them and in many contexts they might be reversed or overturned because the reasons do not persuade a uh, higher authority sir so one more follow up sir sure, please go ahead sir but there is one procedural infirmity also i researched the judge also it is bibhi pratash kumar in january his tenure was supposed to end it went up to april and then he was given an extension of exactly 3 months his tenure was supposed to end in july on 26 june he is doing that supreme court with all its inconsistencies the judges at least have that stability of tenure <laughs> so right okay interesting point i am just going to say certain things i don't i see to the best of my knowledge in clt i don't know whether they have a power of content but maybe we should check it up and therefore you know the reason is because uh, i don't want to tread that path of because this is going to get into public domain i want to cautiously make sure that you know we are not saying something which could be construed as uh, contemptuous but you know i'm not sure whether let's say just a tenure would make a lot of difference but you know having said that very quickly i will make in the last the second part of my presentation you will see i will make certain comments uh, related to uh, the the conditions of employment as well but those comments by and large come out from the past precedent rather than impression let me let's also look at the other question on the chat which is uh, jatin's point which is with respect to interim versus final order the concern is that the tribunal has not followed the three prong test for interim but if they are not passing an interim order wouldn't it imply that they have not followed one or all of the three tests and will it be necessary to reiterate the points again but they are passing these interim orders jatin because if you see the judgment the outcome is you know in the interim until the time that there is a hearing which takes place they have already done certain things which are more or less uh, like an interim order right because they may also be irreversible right which is they virtually the jim khana club's decision making process is not any more left to the discretion of the governing board anymore because government already has at least in terms of the nc or lt order i'm not sure whether this order has already been appealed but at least in terms of this order it seems like the composition has already been changed so effectively speaking it looks like they are in fact passing certain interim orders right sir Even i have a question in general sure. Sure. so sir if uh, there are like most of the cases would ask for interim order as i have mentioned in my second point as well and if the interim orders are not passed by by the tribunal or by the court is it necessary that for not passing these interim orders every time the reasoning has to be mentioned right okay i was just getting on to your second point but good that you asked so you see i mean this is that popular and famous case of ranjit sinha in indian supreme court right where there was a bench led by justice sikri who said that you know we do have some reasons but we are not writing those reasons because if we write those reasons it will somehow prejudice the central bureau of investigation and then they say that you know since we have given the reasons for not giving reasons our order should not be seen as an unreasoned order if that sounds tautological to you well you know this is the supreme court of india in ranjit sinha a uh, case right which relates to central bureau of investigation but i suppose one can say that at least in ranjit sena case the supreme court of india gave reasons for not giving reasons right in nclt's context of uh, delhi jim khana 
NCLT is not really giving us any reasons because of which they have not really dealt with or given reasons related to not passing interim order. Right? In that sense, one can see that there is an absence of reason nevertheless. Jatin? Yes, sir. Got it. Thanks. Okay, now let me put the one pager back here. And as I said, I'll make certain other comments as well on the composition. So the third point relies, uh, actually depends upon this reliance upon website for evidence. Now this is on para 24, page 38 of the decision. So let's see that just quickly, just to make sure we appreciate what is it that we are talking about, right? So page 38 and para 24, it takes a while to get back because, um, you know, otherwise it doesn't, okay, this is, working so it's fine okay para 24 page 38 so here what is it talking about it says that no it has seen certain things from the website by the way this is what it talks about right Okay, hang on, this is not the paragraph which I was looking for. But you know, there is basically a part of the judgment where what NCLT does, it says that, you know, if you go through the website of Delhi Gymkhana Club, there are so many things which are visible from the website itself. And then it talks about how the website itself indicates how there is some kind of a barrier to entry for people to enter this gymkhana, right, as a club. And that's the part which is of interest to me. Now, if you have seen the judgment, you should be able to see this. I think the paragraph number here is inaccurate, but the point which I wanted to make is slightly different, which is, and this is slightly related to what uh, Shantanu just mentioned. Okay, so the, the judge here is uh, BSV Prakash Kumar. Right? Okay, Lahata is paragraph 16. So, okay, thank you for pointing that out. We can look at paragraph 16. Uh, so, so here, the judge's name is interesting because I'm not sure whether you recall, but this is uh, where, you know, I must uh, take this opportunity to thank everybody who contributed to organizing those Friday lecture series, uh, starting with Pranav Dhawan and his friends. There are several of you, I understand. He's not the only one. But nevertheless, I'll tell you why I'm thanking all of you because uh, a while ago, you'd recall, we had looked at the NCLT Mumbai bench decision in Cyrus Mystery. This is the Tata Sons decision. Right? Anybody recalls who the judge was or who wrote the judgment in Cyrus Mystery's case, NCLT Mumbai bench decision? No? For some reason, I don't know whether they are same people, by the way, because there is no profile, but the name is the same, which is BSV Prakash Kumar. So it's interesting only because if it is the same individual that is, and I'm making an assumption over here that they are the same because I have no way of verifying this or no way of quickly verifying this. Is yeah, the acting he's the president. Same person. Sorry? He is the same person. Now he has again been transferred from Chennai to Bombay. Right. No, he is the acting president, BSV Prakash Kumar, and the point which I'm trying to make is slightly different though. You would recall what had happened in uh, NCLT Mumbai decision of uh, Cyrus Mystery and Tata Sons. In that decision, he had lamented that being an NCLT judge, his hands are really tied in terms of evidence gathering because all he can do is rely upon the affidavit which is filed by the party. You would also recall, if you go back to that judgment, he had cited the jurisprudence or the manner in which UK courts function. And he said that, you no know, UK judges have a wider latitude. And he lamented that, you know, he is hobbled because of the Companies Act. He can only rely upon affidavit. Very interestingly, though, what it does here 
And I'll go back to my one page job, which is here he relies upon the Delhi Gymkhana website. He doesn't even wait for an affidavit to come by because his problem is that although he wants Delhi Gymkhana Club to file a reply, they have filed an interim sort of, sort of objection to the entire case which is going on. And therefore, what it does, I suppose, faced with a situation where he perceives that Delhi Jim Khanna Club is not really uh, cooperating, he relies upon their website for evidence. Right? And some, I think, you know, Leher has mentioned that this is in Para 16. We can quickly see what is it that we are trying to say over here. This is in Para 16 of the judgment from the website. What is it that they are seeking out, right? Uh, maybe Lai, you can read it out if you already have it with you. Um, yes, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, you are. Please go ahead. Okay. On seeing the website of the very club, I have come across through a looking back put up in the website, which is as follows. As a sporting club, the Jim Khana locked lacked a swimming pool and squash courts until the 1930s. The Weissregal house under construction had no swimming pools either. The Weissroy's wife, Lady Willington, having, was having a hard time finding a place to swim. She would have to use pools, uh, pools houses of wealthy Indians in New Delhi. She was not happy about it and was getting restless with constructors working uh, in Weissregal house. She finally found a way out and before her husband's term ended, she gifted rupees 21,000 for the construction of the swimming pool. Her munificent gifts were not going to go unrecognized and the general committee soon ordered the suitably inscribed tables to be put up in recognition of her generosity. The gleaming ta tablets, um, Lady Willington swimming bath and the Willington squash courts would be quickly ordered and put up well in time before the Viceroy, Lord Willington and Lady Willington would visit the Gymkhana club for their farewell on 16th March, 1936. Right. Thank you very much. So this is the paragraph you can see. I've also put it on share screen now. It says on seeing the website of the very club. And then para 17 also says on reading the above, anybody can infer, right? So. So this is what uh, the judicial member of NCLT is looking at in Delhi Jimkhana Club. Right? And what he has done is essentially, you know, here he has not found himself to be hobbled by the Companies Act limitations of merely relying upon affidavit. And this is a jurisprudential point, which is, it's a point of incoherence, right? Which is, you're the same judge in a different case, you take a different sort of a standard for uh, assessment of facts before you. And in this case, he has utilized a very different sort of standard of assessment altogether. Now, what is the problem here? If you do that, essentially, you know, you create transaction costs, right? Which is the moment you are incoherent and I'm sharing screen over here. Uh, essentially, you do create transaction costs. And I mean, in terms of uh, codes, right? writing it over here. So this is from course transaction cause. Why is it bad? Because it leads to problems related to, let's say, certainty and predictability, right? Which is, so we won't know in our new case, in the next case, what is the standard that the tribunal should have adopted? So that's the real problem, which is arising in this particular case, insofar as the manner in which it has gone about looking at the standard for assessment. So I'm going back to the one feature here. So on the third point, this reliance upon website for evidence. As said, you know, recall the affidavit lament in Cyrus mystery. It's the same judge. And thanks to Leher, you know, this is para 16, page 31. There's also some evidentiary standard that they talk about in para 24. But all of this leads to a transaction cost problem in course theorem sort of sense of the term. But there's one more bit over here, by the way, you know. And this is certainly not contemptuous because it doesn't relate to a judge at all. But you know, it's interesting to see what uh, Mr. Ratan Tata had actually said about Justice uh, BSV Prakash Kumar in the wake of the decision which came about. So I'm going to open that up, right? Okay, so uh, it's, this is the 
Okay, hang on. I'll just open that up and then get back to share screen. This is from a news report, right? So, so this took a bit of research because I couldn't find the original press statement. But nevertheless, you know, if somebody finds the original press statement, please share. But you see, what is it that Mr. Tata had said about NCLT, and I suppose in particular about Justice uh, BSV Prakash Kumar, because he's the one who uh, passed the judgment. He was the author, right? He said, professionalism and fairness have highlighted over here. And he says, uh, appreciation, this is quote unquote, right? So I'm assuming this is from the press release. It says appreciation to all those involved in the NCLT and particularly the high integrity of the judicial process. So perhaps, you know, faced with such kind of uh, uh, bouquets, maybe, you know, the, there was an encouragement to do certain things, but nevertheless, you know, regardless of that kind of encouragement, the point that I'm trying to make here is slightly different here, which is to see the moment a judge is incoherent between two different decisions, it creates transaction costs. And that is the problem because it increases some kind of a cost related to planning of your affairs in life, right? Which is, let's say for instance, regardless of whatever you feel about the outcome of the Delhi Jim Khana club, like, you know, we don't know what really will happen in the next case, right? And that is where my fourth point also comes in, which is about the holy grail of public interest. This entire case, if you go back to the Companies Act provision, and this requires a bit of juggling, I understand, but nevertheless, the Companies Act is talking about public interest, right? So I'm just going to open that page, which talks about public interest. And here you see, so I hope this is visible to you. Back to clause two, it says in the opinion that the it is of the opinion that the affairs of the company are being conducted in a manner prejudicial to public interest. Now, the question that really arises in Delhi Jim Khanna Club is that what is that public interest really? You know, I think time and again, what the tribunal does though, it talks about, because it's not an unarticulated major premise, it's very clearly concerned about the land which has been given by government for almost at a song, right? It's almost free. And for them, it seems, or for the tribunal, it seems, it seems to be dispositive of public interest. But I'm not sure whether that is based upon any kind of precedent as such. That because you see, I mean, for any particular corporate entity, and this goes to the basics of corporate law, right? Which is any corporate vehicle can be possibly misused for different purposes, right? But nevertheless, merely because let's say a lot of money is involved. Let's say, you know, government has given land way back in 1928 or 1918 or so. And now the value of land has gone up many fold. Now, is that something which is uh, sufficient for the purposes of public interest or not? It seems unclear to me from the NCLT judgment that they are basing it on any past precedent or let's say uh, any statute which says that, you know, public interest would indicate that how much of money state has invested through land. Because you see, the technical aspect here is all the more interesting. The land has not been sold. It's on what is called perpetual lease. Just that the lease amount now sounds very low because a lot of time has passed. But way back, if you go in time, 1928 or so, there was some amount of money which was paid, some, you know, 4,200 amount of rupees and stuff like that. Now, what is the present day value of those 4,200 odd rupees? I have not computed, but nevertheless, you see, this is not a lack of consideration issue, right? A basic contract law, of course, uh, common law uh, says that, you know, uh, at least in context like India, the consideration or the adequacy of consideration is not supposed to be of interest. Even if it is one rupee, it should be okay from the perspective of uh, contract law. It's, uh, but nevertheless, what happens is that for the NCLT, the tribunal, this aspect plays a lot of role. They're very put uh, you know, government has given this land which is fairly expensive. 
Now that's the third or fourth part of my argument. Now see, since we don't know what are the bounds of this public interest, this again increases transaction cost really because you know, unless we really know what is the meaning of public interest that Supreme Court is in, has in mind or what is the meaning that the NCLT is applying, this will all lead to more uncertainty and more unpredictability. With that, I come to the last part of this presentation, which is on public choice theory. So we will look at para 24 and para 29 of the judgment. You see, the concern here is very simply this. The Supreme Court seems to be quite uh, enamored of the government, sorry, not the Supreme Court, the, the NCLT over here, the National Company Law Tribunal, seems to be the way they use the language. They seem to be quite enamored of government. Why do I say that? Because the kind of language that they are using. Because one question was that, uh, for instance, let's say what Delhi Jim Khana Club is saying, they are saying that there are these malafides which are involved in this petition. Now, what kind of malafide? Of course, if you read the judgment, they are interesting. They say one, some government official prepared a 4,000 page report or gave an opinion on 4,000 page report in 24 hours. This is the Delhi Gymkhana Club argument. I'm not making this argument. They say that how is it humanly possible to, you know, read 4,000 pages and then have an opinion. So the sum and substance there is that, you know, the Gymkhana Club is saying that not everything is okay with the manner in which government has acted. This is para 24. You see what they say. Uh, this is uh, the NCLT, the tribunal. It says it is the state fighting for a larger cause and for public at large. It says normally malafides cannot be attributed to the state. Trying to suggest that is repeated in para 29. So let's look at para 29. And what does it say, right? If you can see this, this is on screen share says state will not have a personal interest or economic interest in relation to affairs of any company it only keeps watching as to whether the company is paying taxes regularly or not you can see my comment on the left hand side this is the idea which i'm trying to suggest to you what is public choice theory well essentially you know there are scholars who talk about how and this is very simple in one sense since law and economics relies upon a basic notion of uh, rational self-interest. The question that some scholars ask is, why wouldn't a similar work for the government? So this is public choice theory, essentially saying that if law and economics is right, in its assumption that everybody is self-interested, then those individuals who work for the government, which means state institutions as well, they should be self-interested. And therefore it means that when they are acting, or when they are taking action, they are not really acting in public interest, but they are acting in self-interest. Now you can see how NCLT feels here that public choice theory is certainly wrong, right? Or they are not even aware of something called public choice theory that state officials could also possibly be self-interested. And that's the point which I'm trying to make. With that, I can claim that my fifth part of uh, my presentation is done too and then we can just get on to the concluding observations unless you have some queries question comments and this is just quickly doing our share screen fifth part was public choice theory we looked at para 24 page 38 on malafide para 29 as well on this public choice theory and the only part which is left is now concluding observations which i'll make very quickly but before that, I think on the chat, there is something which is uh, just in right? Let me read that out. It appears from the judgment that the tribunal is looking into it because it is lead. Because as it appears from the promotion of industrialization of the land is given to certain corporate houses at a very cheap rate. And I'm not sure if the tribunal is concerned with the price, would the giving away of land by government at cheap rates to promote industries in future can the tribunal say that the government has given a cheap rates and hence violative of public interest? So I think, you know, you are right, Chatin, that, you know, at parts it seems unclear, 
but it also seems in at times that you know they are concerned about both not just that the state has given it on lease but also that you know the price which is being paid is very low because you know in, in one part they say that the amount that the gym khana club pays as lease is very very low now it looks like you know at least at some level the tribunal is concerned about it and then there is a private message which talks about how state works on the welfare state concept so oh, yes i mean all of this is a right proposition to make only thing is you see if the indian state is a welfare state the corporate law might not be a mechanism to achieve that end right and this is where my concluding observations also come in which is you see if we go back to my claim now see what is it that i am actually trying to suggest over here so is barbed wire is redistribution a legitimate realm of nclt concern right see redistribution because the society is unequal is certainly a legitimate concern of the state i'm not challenging that the question really is whether nclt is the right vehicle to do this or corporate law is the right instrument to do this people who work in the field of law economics sir will have lot of problem with this because uh, in general the theory suggests that corporate law is not really a good instrument for redistribution because it's a very really blunt instrument right it can also have a chilling effect on others who want to use corporate vehicles as a legitimate means of doing business in general what scholars argue who work in law and economics is that tax law would be a legitimate way to redistribute wealth because it will lead to lower transaction cost in terms of that redistribution so this is also you know in terms of my observations this is also my concluding observations and to go back to my claim uh, to to start with i had suggested that i'll make this claim and i said that you know i hope i'll be able to prove this this is a two fold statement one is that the tribunal in its concern for redistribution glosses over companies act 2013 and stare decisis we have taken examples from several past cases to prove this we have also looked at some provisions of companies act to prove this and i also said that this is an emblematic case study in avoidable transaction cost which engender uncertainty and unpredictability of course having said that you know in one sense some of these comments might be slightly premature in one sense which is that very likely this case is going to shift to high courts to me it seems uh, quite likely only because the kind of lawyers who have represented i'm sure that you know they will quickly uh, get on to this idea that nclt has raised concerns and questions which are more legitimately constitutional law concerns and therefore they should be uh, you know looked at from constitutional law perspective so in that sense it might be slightly premature but nevertheless i think you know the observations which are making will be useful in the context of future cases that we will see in the context of oppression and prejudice now let me stop over there and then welcome comments questions concerns disagreements all of them are welcome so please go ahead excuse me sir yeah yeah sir just a comment uh, so I sir think. just a contradictory position i think i might be wrong but i feel that it's taken the nclt has taken a contradictory position in one of its statements so first it says that in para 29 that time lag cannot be a defense because once because once uh, the notice there should be notice and the central go the government has to be come into notice for it to take action but in para 23 in para 33 it again says that state need not remain waiting for any complaint from the government so i think there's a contradiction in passing of this sure on one point it says that it should wait for the notice and it the time lag is not a defense and on the other hand it says that uh, the state need not remain uh, waiting for any complaint from the government right no absolutely good point thank you okay there is a private comment here which is uh, i think delhi high court is likely to have more gym khana members than nclt that might increase the preference for this forum uh, but you know it might not necessarily be a good comment to make in public yeah, i do i can actually add this is put on the chat but i can add that, you know there are several parts where the nclt says that you know this is only open to the elites of the country including supreme court judges and stuff like that 
So I suppose NCLT also does mention something related to, I suppose, the involvement of judges as well. But nevertheless, you know, there's not much said in the NCLT decision specifically about Delhi High Court. So we can't really uh, conclude either way. So may I? Yes, please. Vishet, go ahead. Um, so firstly, I, when I was reading the case, I could not help but think, um, how hard would it have been for Jim Khanna to just amend the Articles of Association and avoid this whole problem altogether? That's essentially why what the NCLT has done is that it has in the interim put government nominees in the governing board because they understand that it's possible in terms of the Companies Act to amend the Articles of Association. So, you know, your, your observation is uh, absolutely right. And it looks like the NCLT was also concerned about it, though, though they don't necessarily articulate this concern. And so one more observation I had was, even though they're talking about public interest, the concern that they have at least um, said, uh, made explicit is not public interest at large, but more akin but since they're talking about the waiting list and the fact that those members who are in the waiting list are not getting in, the public interest is confined to people who can pay the exorbitant fees and what they have also mentioned specifically as exorbitant processes. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I, I don't think it's a public interest in the general sense of the term, but for people who can pay 22 lakhs plus the years and four decades of interest from four to four decades. Of no, absolutely. I mean, this is a really a question of how exactly does the club function and whether somebody is perturbed about it, but does it really have any public interest or not? The NCLT seems to think that it has, I mean, not much is going to change in September if this is what the NCLT believes because the next state of hearing is sometime in September, but we'll have to see, you know, if it is, if the case goes to high court, for instance, will they agree? Finally, I suppose the kind of stakes which are involved, this will certainly land up in Supreme Court as well. Okay, there is a, sorry, there is a question in the chat, so let me read that out. Nandita Batra says there is a going concern about lease price in Delhi, be it Jimkhana club or hospitals, whether the government could have used contract law to cancel the lease given section 16 of Indian Contract Act. Well, I suppose if government is the lessor, then you know, nothing prevents the government from cancelling the lease. In a way, I suppose your question is very interesting because instead of simply acting as a lessor and cancelling the lease, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs is using the Companies Act oppression and prejudice provision to do certain, certain things against the Jim Khanna Club. I don't know whether you want to say something in a follow-up. So Nandita, go ahead if you have any follow-up. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, can you hear me? I can. Loud and clear. Please go ahead. All right. Uh, so be it the charitable hospitals which have been set up in Delhi, the matter has in fact gone to the Supreme Court in Mulchand Hospital's case. So I've been following all these cases. So the concern is, do we need to have a mechanism in lobby contract or be it rent law wherein we can look at the prices so you know now that we have uh, i'm taking another example i i don't know how connected it is but now that we have the uh, land acquisition act where there is a provision to ensure fair prices right and not one time prices so government as a lesser not as uh, you know right. the final taker also needs to have that mechanism so that you know it does not use a tool which is suitable for this redistribution of wealth because redistribution is a concern but we haven't we don't have a p proper tool to deal with that apart from article 226 or 32 right. no absolutely thank you very much that's a very good point uh, you are absolutely right i'll only suggest that you know i think pranav dhawan had mentioned in one of the chats uh, Consumer Protection Act. Now that's one legislation which could also be used in terms of price gouging and unfair pricing scenario. I think the amended version has not yet been put into effect, but the amended version has a more a relatively clearer language related to unfair pricing scenario. Sir, so, but if it is a commercial transaction, then Consumer Protection Act will not come into picture. Sure, but you see, I mean, who can uh, so? So even in the context of a commercial transaction, see in between the government and Jim Khanna club, it's a commercial transaction, right? But then CCI but see, could... No, CCI does not come into picture here. Just, uh, sorry, let me just finish this bit. I'll tell you how Consumer Protection Act may come about. I think you would recall 
just two minutes ago, Jatin mentioned this, right? Which is that in some parts they are concerned about, or NCLT judgment is concerned about the high fee which is involved in becoming a member. Mm -hmm. Now, any of the members who are on the wait list, and if they are concerned about unfair pricing, so instead of relying upon the government to do certain things for them, it could be more like a self-empowered sort of a situation where a potential member of the Delhi Gym Khana Club could possibly use because see inter se a potential member and gym khana club it's not a commercial transaction mm -hmm. yes sorry now you had some other points so go ahead no 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 that's it that's it so thank you so thank you yes please go on sir with respect to ishan's point of changing the aois um, right, so, yeah. yes, so, sir, the EOS can be changed with respect to membership, but I don't see how it will affect the public interest in large as has been mentioned by NCRT, where it looks into the lease and cheap rates, where it is in the land. So, I don't understand how a changing of EOS could have a greater impact. On right. So, the part where Ishit's point will come about as a relevant bit is you see, there are certain aspects of the judgment which is very concerned about elitism, right? or Gymkhana club being classist, that only generations after generations, certain families are controlling this club. And then there is a part where the judgment talks about how, although one of the avowed purpose of Gymkhana club is sports facilities, but I think, you know, my numbers might be inaccurate, but it says that around 3% of expenditure or merely 3% of expenditure is on sports activity. So I suppose that's where Ishit is coming from, that he's saying, that you see, if you can amplify in your MOA and AOA, that you know I am not bound to spend more than three percent of my money on sports because sports is not my only purpose, but there are other purposes as well. In which case, you know, if the tribunal says that your activities, what it calls recreational activities, is beyond the scope of your MOA or AOA, to that extent, that argument may not hold water. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Any more questions? Anybody else? Sir, I just had an observation. Sir, Please, did, go ahead. Do you, do you think it would have been a good idea if, if NCLT even wanted to do this? So rather than couching it in terms of going in prejudice to public interest, they could say that uh, the AOA of the company are limited. And it is a mismanagement of the company rather than being prejudicial to the public interest. So perhaps it could have been a better case, a better case could be made under section 241. Sorry, Rajat, I don't know whether other. So can you hear me now? Yeah, I can. He's gone. Yes, sir. So my point, uh, my point was that would it, have, would it have been a good case to make that this is rather than making a case of prejudicial to public interest. It is a case of mismanagement of the company, mismanagement in functioning of the company because uh, the company is functioning beyond what the AOA proposed, what, what the AOA restricted to. Given that there are memberships which are being given to other uh, other kinds of memberships being created, apart from the ones that are mentioned in the AOA, etc. So a mismanagement argument could have been a better way to reach the same conclusion rather than uh, saying that it's a, a prejudicial to public interest. What, what's your take on that? Okay, possibly Rajat. I mean, there is an element of an argument which makes sense, but there is an element which could also be troublesome, right? So insofar as somebody is arguing that this is prejudicial, I mean, I don't use the term mismanagement only because if you read the text of the section, it uh, doesn't talk about mismanagement. It only talks about prejudice, right? So unfair prejudice sort of scenario. See, insofar as let's say a member of the company takes that logic, it seems to make sense. There is something inherently bothersome about giving that entitlement to the state or state keeping that entitlement to itself. And you can see where the problem really lies. Delhi Gymkhana Club, I mean, I think if it goes through 
several rounds of litigation you will see you know it will have lot of questions that it will lead to related to whether central government should at all have a locus standi or standing to initiate these uh, proceedings because after all you see you know if we for many of you i think the language will be familiar if we just use the cathedral model you know it's quite interesting right it challenges the property rule model of the companies context to make it a liability rule model which could lead to all sorts of issues and you know, I, i don't need to explain this over here so if if it makes sense to you the cathedral model that's good if it doesn't make sense of course you know we can take it elsewhere but the larger point here is this right if you give an entitlement to the state which the statute does i'm not saying that no the statute doesn't the larger problem really is that is it in some manner going back to the license permit raj of pre 1991 which is instead of relying upon the wisdom of the people who want to use the corporate law vehicle or corporate entities as a vehicle to conduct business do you do you leave some sort of leeway for the state to come in and therefore it might have a chilling effect upon entrepreneurship i think that's the only part which is which could possibly be troublesome i know it will sound slightly philosophical but nevertheless you know that's the reason rajat why why i think that you know the moment you give an entitlement to the state to bring in these proceedings it could be quite uh, troublesome and problematic thank you sir okay there is another question on the chat ishit has put uh, also that if it's instead of gc meetings to change the membership composition types limits etc they could also have changed the aoas to ensure that the changes they have made are not inconsistent with the limit okay so issue this is not a question this is an addition to it's supplemental to uh, to jatin's point right so okay thank you any further question comments concerns if not then let's bring this to close i think you know it's 6:14 we have finished 1 hour and 15 minutes of looking at nclt judgment thank you very much to yes. all of you for listening to this posing questions participating let me hand this back to nls ir if they have any comments or concluding remarks thank you thank you sir i would request to kashish the chief editor of nls ir to give a vote of thanks i hope i'm audible yes you are kashish go ahead um thank you so much sir before i wrap up uh, in my experience with interning at the supreme court and with the judges and the lawyers etc there's a popular thing that goes around that peep, uh, that peep, uh, that most lawyers or judges are disgruntled about a dilejam khana club so long as they are on the wait list and <laughs> as soon as they make it it's all hunky dory um so thank you so much for having this discussion with us sir and i it was really enriching it it has given us a lot to think about and thank you everyone uh, who participated in the discussion as well uh, i hope this uh, as soon as the public recording of this uh, we, this lecture and webinar will be available people will watch it and have a, a lot more to think about too um, we also encourage everyone to actually write and contribute in terms of literature uh, on this club uh, on this decision that has come out by the nclt and like analyzing its jurisprudence both from a legalistic perspective or a law and economics perspective and we would love to host it on our uh, online platform which is nlsir online which we have recently come up with uh, the platform seeks to ensure this can contemporary engagement and soon we are coming up with a revamped model of the nlsir online on our new website uh, i hope that serves as a platform for further engagement on this topic uh thank you so much sir for uh, collaborating with nlsir and the friday lecture series uh, for you, allowing us this opportunity to host you and i hope uh, i hope we can engage with you in the future too uh, on further webinars i'm delighted to if i may i'll only say more power to nlsir thank you so much sir <laughs>